Lord, sometimes just reading your word, we see how you work, and we want to be able to recognize when it's you, God, and recognize when it's not you, and what is you, and what is not you, God. Thank you, Lord, that you're not our rabbit's foot, but you are our living and loving God, alive and well, willing to lead us and guide us and take us by the hand, and never leaving nor forsaking us, God. Show us in your word what you want us to see. We want to see it in your name and for your glory, King Jesus. Amen. 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 Have you guys ever heard me say this is the funniest section of scripture ever? Have you ever heard me say that before? <laughs> this is by far the funniest section of scripture ever. It doesn't start that way, but it ends that way. Now, I'm going to try and paraphrase some of it because there's three chapters. Two of them are, are fairly long, but I want you to stay with me, get a feel for it. I'm going to tell the story. If I lose you, please just raise your hand and let me know, and, and I'll explain and reiterate. There's a lot of ground to cover, but I couldn't break it up. I tried, it just not possible. Verse 1, chapter 4, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now, if you have not been here, We've been looking at the life of young Samuel, dedicated to the Lord at a very young age, some say three, four, five years old. About 12 is when he heard the voice of the Lord serving under a, um, the last uh, judge of Israel named Eli. This is the story of Eli's demise continuing now. Verse 1, the last part. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped in Aphek. The Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. Give me your attention, please. You will see the name Philistines all throughout Scripture. His people from the land of Philistia, um, Goliath was one of the Philistines. They are the eternal enemies, almost like, you know how uh, hyenas are enemies to lions? That's just the way it is. It's just the way it always will be. Lions and hyenas don't hang out together. They don't belong together. Same thing. The Philistines are the eternal enemy. You're going to see it all. Philistines, Philistines. But here, the Philistines go to war. Israel says, we're going to liberate ourselves. They go to war and they lose. And about 4,000 Israelites die in the field. Verse 3. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of the enemies. Please listen to me. Whole message here today. The whole message is this. God is not your lucky charm. God is not your rabbit's foot. And what we do is we tend to think of the difference between luck and providence as whether we've done right or not done right, whether we have this or don't have this. If I keep a Bible in my car, I might get, get less tickets. If I keep a Bible in my house, I probably won't get robbed. If I pray over my children every single day, nothing bad will ever happen to them. None of those things are true. None of them. Bad things will happen to good people, and the sovereign hand of God is still upon them. Isn't that amazing? Here, how bad is it when the very elders of Israel are saying, we've got to get the Ark of the Covenant. Now, new to Scripture, new to our Bible studies, what's the Ark of the Covenant? Does anybody remember Raiders of the Lost Ark? That was a movie about the Ark of the Covenant. Israel built a box, and upon it they sat the mercy seat. There was two angels with wings reaching back, and inside this box, this Ark, was a jar of manna, the budded rod of Aaron, and the Ten Commandments, all speaking of the majesty of God, when if you look at it from a prophetic way, all pointing to the Lord Jesus. Well, as it'll happen in our lives, things automatically become 
good luck charms. Yes, that's what it is. That's why God allowed us to get defeated, because we didn't have the Ark of the Covenant in the camp. How foolish. How silly to think that a box with some trinkets in it. Now, that doesn't diminish the fact that the very power of God was existing in that, but it was the faith in God, not a box. Listen to me. This is a Bible. And in the hands of the believer, in the heart of the believer, could tear down every wall, can, can obliterate every enemy, could guide you through life. But in the hands of somebody who doesn't believe, who doesn't get it, it's just a book. It means nothing. You could spit on it, you could rub it, you can, you can throw it, you can run it over your car. It doesn't do anything for you. Do you understand that? Do you guys understand that? Everybody understands that? The elders of Israel, they don't even know that. How bad, how far has the nation come when the very elders themselves? Verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh that they may bring from the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. The cherubim were the two angels that were on top of it. It was said, and you'll see it about 70, 80 times in scripture, he is the God who dwells between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Now, I love this. Hophni and Phinehas. Does everybody remember those two guys? They made, they made the offering of the Lord obnoxious. They were sleeping with the women that came to the... I mean, these were two horrible characters. Men of low grade. And they thought, don't worry, the reason we got defeated is because we didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. You know, there's this principle, and I want you not to lose sight of this, and I don't want to dwell too long in here because we do have a long way to go, but there's a fine line between allowing God to bless your life with the way you behave and thinking that God's punishing you because you did wrong. There is a point in time where God knocks on your heart enough, and if you harden your heart, harden your heart, harden your heart, as Hophni and Phinehas did, God takes his hand of protection from you. But God does not punish the blessed people of God. You, filled with the Holy Spirit, are the blessed people of God. And you think, oh, I know why God's punished. Last night I looked at that. Last, oh, I did this. I, I shouldn't have said that. God's punishing me. How many of you guys ever thought that? That's not what God does. Now, there are certain laws like the law of gravity that God doesn't break. If I put this over there and let it go, it falls. That's the law of gravity. If you have sex outside of marriage, it's the law. God cannot bless that relationship. You can't ask God, bless my relationship, please. God says, I'm sorry, I can't. Why? Because you're having sex and you're not repentant of it. People say, why, I, money, I, I don't have money, I, no matter how much I make, no matter how, listen to me, it's a law. If you want your money blessed, you first give the first 10% to the storehouse so God can feed his poor. That blesses the rest of your money. Otherwise, I don't care if you make 100000 a year, 25000 a year, it ain't going very far. That's the law. Now, God doesn't punish you. Man, I, I, I was in the, I opened my car door and I dinged the guy's car next to me and I was in such a, I just left and now I got a flat tire. Man, I have such bad luck. No. It goes all the way up. Listen, God loves you. He loves you. He doesn't punish you. He will sometimes allow you to punish yourself. He sometimes cannot bless relationships, finances, certain things in your life because you've not blessed him. It's not that he's mad at you. The Bible says that the fathers that love their children the most are the ones that discipline them, that chastise them, 
that allowed things to happen in their lives and didn't protect them from it when they didn't deserve it. Are we understanding this principle here? I don't want to dwell. I could stay there for hours and talk about that and really explain it. But understand this. Eli, his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were dogs. And just because they stood next to the Ark of the Covenant wasn't going to give them any more alpo. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the shout of this great what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, so the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us, who will deliver us from the hand of those mighty gods? Again, give me your attention. The Philistines here, who knows how far away it is, a couple of miles, these great shouts. What's going on in the camp? Why is it? We just stomped them. We just killed 4,000. Why are they screaming? The very earth beneath our feet shakes. Then they heard from the grapevine, they brought the Ark of the Covenant. Now listen, all the earth knows now and then what Israel did, what God did for the Israelites to set them free from Egypt, the plagues that he sent upon them. All the world knows it. Even to this day, everybody knows the story of the Ten Commandments and how Israel, how, how God hardened Pharaoh's heart to set Israel free from its captives. Are you with me? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with the hand with all the plagues in the wilderness. But then he says in verse 9 something very interesting you got to respect them for. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. They strengthen themselves. They encourage themselves. It's well written. Woe unto the master whose slave becomes his master. Woe unto the master whose slave becomes his master. They said, no, this cannot happen. We can't. Strengthen yourself. Don't be afraid. We can do it. <coughs> so the Philistines fought, verse 10, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle ran from the battle line the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now when he came there, Eli was sitting on a seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it all that the city cried out, when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, what does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli, now, give me attention, please. He said that Eli's heart trembled for the ark of God. Hophni and Phinehas came to, the, came to Shiloh, this neighborhood Shiloh, and they took the ark of the covenant. And, and Eli was like, oh, my goodness, my sons took the ark of the covenant. Now, whether he knew they were doomed or not, I don't know whether he was. We don't know the state of Eli. We kind of hope, because he's an old guy and he's weak and he's extremely fat, we kind of hope there was some good left in him, but we just don't know. He certainly made terrible decisions, certainly didn't put his kids in line. This guy runs through the camp, sees Eli, runs right by him, goes and tells the city, the people of the city start freaking out about what happened. Eli says, what happened? What happened? Verse 15. Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there's been a very great slaughter among the people. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. Again, five things happened. You ready? Battle. Israel fled. Great slaughter, sons dead, ark has been captured. Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of, the, of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backwards by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died for the man was old and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years. 
He didn't care about anything else. When he heard the Ark of the Covenant got captured, ah, boom, dead. That's it. He's done. Bye, Eli. Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured, because of father in law and her husband and she said the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured give me your attention one of them has a pregnant wife she finds out that dead and the ark got captured she goes right into labor she gives birth she doesn't even care she says she names the child Ichabod which believes the glory is gone or the glory departed that's a heck of a name right imagine blaming the kid for that Pastor, didn't you say this was one of the funniest sections of Scripture? What's so funny? Not yet, but stay with me. It gets really good here. <laughs> Not a good time in Israel. But listen, look, guys, refocus for a second. Look, look, just refocus. Listen to me. We just came through the book of Judges. This is funny compared to that, right? <laughs> you all have been here for the last few months, the last, well, the last many months. Judges was horrible, man. This was like, I could deal with this. Hophni and Phineas are dead, like big whoop. Eli, he's dead, like what a tragedy. Samuel's still alive. Look at the bright side. <laughs> then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod, which is one of the cities of the Philistines. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now Dagon was one of their gods, their chief god. He was the god of their fertility. He was the god of their blessing. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Give me your attention. They take the ark. They put it in the temple right next to Dagon. Now we have Dagon. Now Dagon was a giant fish head. He has a giant statue. They had a giant fish head with hands that stuck out. Now what you wanted to sacrifice to Dagon, you'd put in his hands. Now some would say Dagon is the same one who had in his belly was a furnace, an iron furnace, where they put wood or coal or hay or whatever in there, and they burn it up, and the thing would get so hot, his hands would get so hot, that when you put the offering in his hands, it would burn up. You with me? They also were into child sacrifice. That was the ultimate fertility, was to give them your first, give Dagon your firstborn child. So there's that temple. They bring it in and they set the ark. Now we've got the Israelites' God and we've got Dagon, our God. Man, we're going to be blessed now. But they leave it in there. The next day they wake up, Dagon is falling on his face. This giant thing's falling on his face before the ark of the covenant. Huh, that's peculiar. <laughs> So, verse, uh, latter part of verse 3, they took Dagon and set it in its place again. Now, I say if you have to set up your God, <laughs> there's a problem. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon falling his face to the ground before the ark. The head of Dagon, oh, I'm sorry, um, latter part of verse 3. So they took Dagon and set in his place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon falling on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into the Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Now, so they set him back in place. They come back the next day and both the, the hands are broken off and the head and they're sitting right in the doorway they get in there and they go this can't be good I mean this is not a good thing right but the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors guys here's where it gets funny that word tumors in the original language you know what it means who said that? Hemorrhoids. 
<laughs> Look it up. <laughs> yeah, he ravaged them, all right. <laughs> yeah, but it gets even better. Um, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. No lie. Therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried away to Gath, another one of the other cities. Maybe they don't know about this thing in Gath. Let's send the thing there. So they picked the thing up. Off to Gath it goes. So they carried the ark of God of Israel away. So it was after they had carried away that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both great and small, and tumors broke out of them. Yes, same word, hemorrhoids. <laughs> Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron, and so it was as the ark of God came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out saying they have brought the ark of the God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so it does not kill us and our people for there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city and the hand of God was very heavy there and the men who did not die were stricken with hemorrhoids and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Listen, I ain't even kidding. It ain't even funny yet. It gets really funny now. But understand this. God will get glory. And we can choose to be a vessel of honor or vessel of dishonor. We can write the name Christian on our chest, on our forehead. We could speak it with our mouth. If our life doesn't display it, God's still going to get glory. We get shame. Do you understand that? You can't, like, trade this thing in. God is not your lucky charm. He's not my lucky charm. And woe to me if I ever treat him that way. Each and every day I desire to get up with obedience. He is watching everything we do. He is with us, but not like the hand of a cop who goes, I see everything you do, with the hand of a doctor, a great physician who says, you don't need that. It's not good for you. That's going to hurt you, my love. But if you'll do it, I'll do it with you. You can't do that with me, God. Oh, I'm doing it with you. Please don't do this with me. I told you I'd never leave you nor forsake you. Do you understand that? What a difference it is. Watch this now. Now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and diviners saying, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it into its place, please. It's tearing us up. So they said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it away empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, what is the trespass offering which we shall return him? So after going to three or four different cities, they finally call for the diviners, they call for the priests, they call for the, the Psychic Friends Network. Please get this thing out of here. It's killing us all. What do we do? Okay, you got to get it back to Israel, but don't send it away empty-handed. Send it with a trespass offering. Fine, we'll send it away with our new Cadillac. Tell us how to get rid of it. Okay, they answered, five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the Lord's... Excuse me? Again, that word for tumors, it's a hemorrhoid. We want you to make a golden hemorrhoid. <laughs> the thoughts that go around my head not trying to be irreverent, not trying to be crass, not trying to be disgusting. Who molded this thing? 
<laughs> Who modeled this thing? Sir. Did I get it? Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Just bothering you? No, I just Just bothering you, you couldn't handle it? OCD? <laughs> Who? <laughs> Indeed. And w did somebody look at that thing and go, yeah, that's a hemorrhoid? <laughs> I've seen a hemorrhoid. That's a hemorrhoid. What's <laughs> scale? Really, did they make it life size? <laughs> did they blow it up? No, it's got to be much bigger than that. <laughs> Goliath's family, let me tell you something. Those giants, they get some hemorrhoids. Bring them over here, let's look. <laughs> According to the number of the lords of the So the same plague was on all of you and your lords. Therefore, you shall make images of your tumors <laughs> and images of your rats that ravage the land. Now, just for a infer, um, quick fact. This is the first time it's ever been mentioned all the way back here that rats are associated with disease. So going all the way back to the bubonic plague, it was told that if rats invade your land, you got problems, get rid of them quick. And you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods and from your land. Now, here's the saddest part of this, guys. And this is, this is not the funny part. What must the Philistines saw to the Israelites at this point? Your God's kicking our butt, literally. But, but look at you. But look at you. Your own God must hate you. How sad. How sad. Where at first they thought this was the power of God, was this Ark of the Covenant. And now they're ready to send up... <laughs> Don't worry about it. Their God hates them even worse because we destroyed them. We just beat 35,000 of them up. It's a sad commentary, even on a Christian. When God exalts a man, please remember, he's not always exalting him because he's being blessed. Sometimes he exalts him to position to reveal to everybody. Some of these giant pastors from these giant churches, the Haggarts and the Swaggarts and all these guys that have been exalted, 20, 30, 40,000 people in that church, and, 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 and everybody thinks how great and God must love them only to reveal their sin to the whole nation. I mean, how horrible it would be. I mean, listen, I sin, I mess up. God doesn't show it on the big screen. I repent, and God in his faithfulness forgives me. But imagine to be exalted, to think you got the world by the hemorrhoids, and all of a sudden it's revealed to the whole world, and your, your, your life is in the newspaper. Listen, the Bible says it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a terrible thing. Don't ever play with God like that. Verse 6, why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their heart when he did mighty things among them? Did they not let the people go that they might depart? Now therefore make a new cart, take two milk cows. Now he, quoting again, knowing even though this is 300 plus years before, he says, listen, don't be stupid. It's well known how Pharaoh was afflicted and hardened his heart over and over again till there was nothing left of their lands. You're getting away with some hemorrhoids and some rats. Get this thing out of here. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a new cart, make a brand new cart, take two milk cows which have never been yoked and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord, set it on the cart and put the articles of God which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by its side. Then send it away and let it go and watch if it goes up the road to its own territory to Beth Shemesh, which is the nearest town of the Hebrews, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us, that all this happened by chance. It's kind of like a just in case. Build a big cart, you know, big, big wheelbarrow type of thing. Tie two cows to it that never plowed a field, do milk cows that, that, that have little calves, take the calves away, put the calves in the stall, and, and tie these two unyoked cows, and just put them on a road, and let's see what happens. 
if the thing goes back to its place, we know that the God of Israel was against us. If it doesn't, all this stuff happened by accident, and we've been giving the wrong person the glory. Now, I love that because isn't that what we do? We think, wow, and I mean no disrespect to your situation because I believe God got me a job. God loves me. Oh, I lost my job. God hates me. Oh, I got a new boyfriend. God loves me. Oh, I lost my girlfriend. God hates me. We do this to God. Please don't. That's why he gave us the scriptures. These are our guidelines. This is our guidepost. All the answers to your life are in here. You need nothing else but this. And if you ever have a question, does God hate me? Does God love me? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? All you need to do is check scripture. If you're not seasoned enough to check scripture, to weigh the spirit out in your heart, that's what church is for. Pastor, can I talk to you? Elder, can I talk to you? Deacon, can I talk to you? Here's the stuff going on in my life. Is God against me? Is God against me? And you find out, well, here's what happened. You know, I got this job and I got this great raise and do you tithe? Well, here's the thing. I've been broke so long. Listen, listen, listen. Don't give me. Do you tithe? Well, really, I don't. Okay, listen. We figured out why you have a curse on your money. Why the Bible says it's like you put it in your pocket and it's like goes through. Man, I just put five bucks in here. It's gone already. Anybody ever notice that the first half of your gas tank goes a lot slower than the second half? <laughs> Why is that? It's the hand of God is against you. No, it's not. No. Don't do that to God. He loves you. He loves you. And everything that happens, happens for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he predestined, he preordained good things and bad for you. So that at the end of your days, you say, God is good all the time. God's been good to me. Do you know how many times I thought, I'm never getting out of this mess. This is horrible. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And yet somehow, some way, here I am. Does anybody bear witness to that? Verse 10, then the men did so. They took two milk cows, hitched them to the cart, and the chest with the golden rats and the images of their hemorrhoids. <laughs> Goodness. Could you imagine the Israelites opening that chest? I have no idea what these are. And one guy's like, I know what those are. Oh, do I know what those are. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. So they make this covenant. They make this promise. They tell their people. And God, for some reason, he makes the cows go down the road. God wanted them to know, listen, don't ever play with me. I'm not to be played with. And even you Philistines can repent and come to me. Now, I wish I could say that they did, but they didn't. At one point in time, you had to say, wait a second. I'm a Philistine. They tore up the best God that we had, Dagon. They afflicted our people. Maybe we should start worshiping the God of Israel. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. I heard about those Ten Commandments. Yeah? Shall have no other gods before me. Shall not covet thy neighbor's what? <laughs> no thanks. That's not the life I want to live. One wife? Uh, 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 uh. Not being able to kill somebody I don't like? Mm -mm -mm. That's not the God for me. But wait a second. This God is all powerful. This God is almighty. Look at what he did to Dagon. I'd rather have sex and kill people. You serious, dude? We laugh, but isn't that what we do? <laughs> we look and we see, it's obvious God's in control of everything. I mean, it's obvious. The whole world, the vast majority of the world, hates Jesus. They hate his book, yet somehow it's still the number one bestseller ever. <laughs> ever. 
Somehow, some way, it's still being printed. Somehow, some way, his people are enduring. Somehow, some way. You guys might be, um, you know that kid that's been coming on Sundays? Uh, you probably wouldn't recognize him. His, his name is Stefan. He's from um, Romania. Romania. He, from Romania. He's funny. He tells the story of how he says to me, I think this funny. In Romania, when the government come against Christians, there are many, many Christians. But when they bless Christians and give us free time, nobody be Christian. And he so nailed it. Christians, the, the, the very seeds of our testimony are watered with our blood. You want to have a revival? Afflict us. Put us down. Crush us. Destroy us. Come after us. Revival. It will break out. The worst thing that's ever happened to Christians is them getting the blessings of God, seemingly. Or at very least, the blessings of this world. Did I say something? No, I was talking to my daughter. Do you understand that? Isn't this crazy? What a crazy thing this is. Christianity grows best in the worst of times. And then we want to, why is God letting this happen in my life? He's getting your attention. And now you're serious about God, aren't you? Listen, God put me through some pretty heavy stuff in my life. Some of which you guys have heard some of the testimonies, most of which you haven't. I'm telling you right now, and I'll be flat out honest, I'm afraid to screw up again. I ain't going back there. Just in case, it was God's hand against me because of my horrible behavior, I'm not going back there. I'm afraid. Every day when I wake up, I am afraid. Every single day, the fear of God grips my heart in such a way that it drives me to prayer in His Word. I ain't going back there. Because I don't know about you all, but the worst things that happened to me in my life, I still dream about them. I still dream about them. I've had many a dream where I'm stuck in prison. And it's like I'm trying to meet with my team. And in prison, they give you this team, which is make-believe team. It's not really your team, but it is your team, but it's really not your team. You guys have been away, know what I'm talking about. And they give you your date when you're supposed to get out, and they tell you this. And it's like, look, and I'm arguing with them. Look, I should have got out like three years ago. I'm telling you my time. And they're like, I'm sorry, man. Look, here it is. I don't know why you haven't been released. I'll talk to the warden. Yeah. And it's like, I'm going back, and, and I'm just, no, but wait, my kids are growing up without me. And I wake up, and I'm like, oh, yeah. I hate those dreams! Does anybody know what I'm talking about or not? I ain't going back there. I remember what God has done. And I remember what happened in my life. I'm telling you, remember. Remember. Because God loves us that much. You understand the craziest thing? When God really loves you, He afflicts you. <laughs> we'll be... <laughs> when God really trusts you enough, you know what He does? He takes this beautiful golden part of your life, and this, shh, shh, it's called a trial, a heavy trial. And He goes, Here, I'm going to find somebody I can trust with a really, I got a really big trial for you. Do you want this trial? And you go, No, I don't want this trial, God. I don't want this trial. He goes, Listen, I know I can trust in you. And I know if I give you this trial, You'll bring glory to my name. No, God, please, no trials. And then he says, but listen, for every second you went through this trial, I'm going to give you 100 years of blessing in heaven. Now, those are not biblical numbers. I'm just giving you an example. But that's what he does. He gives you this trial, and he goes, here, here's your trial. You go through it, and you bring glory to my name. He puts it in your lap, and all of a sudden, death of a child, cancer, uh, poverty, some horrible, horrible thing happens to you. And you look and go, why God? And God looks back at you with the same tears and says, because I love you. I love you. I promise it's going to feel like nothing when you get to heaven. Not this. Anything but this. And, and 
and, and as somebody that's gone through it, it's only those that he trusts the most. And our brain doesn't conceive it because we're looking at it through the eyes of the world. We're looking at it through the eyes of, of earth, not the eyes of heaven. When the angels look and go, my God, look at that. Like they did with Job. The angels were awestruck by Job. Oh my gosh, look at this man. He keeps his integrity. They gathered around in front of him so much so that Satan said, no wonder he worships you. You protect him. I'm trying to get to him. Oh, I know you're trying to get to him. I know you're trying to get to him. When he really trusts you, he gives you a trial. And when he really loves you, he allows your own deeds to sink you. Why? Imagine if you gave your kid everything they wanted whenever they asked for it. You wind up with a spoiled, rotten brat, don't you? Now, let me tell you something. According to Scripture, spoiled, rotten brats don't get to heaven. So God says, no, I love you too much. And he puts a trial. He allows a trial in your life. You, Why did you do this? Just so you'll talk to me. Since things have been good, you ain't, I ain't even seen you. You got that new Cadillac, you're driving around, you're hitting the town, you ain't got nothing for me no more. So I had to take that Cadillac away. It became an idol. And I miss you so much, I took away your Cadillac. Not my Cadillac. God hates me, he took away my Cadillac. No, ding dong, he loves you, he took away your Cadillac. Don't you get it? Oh, you understanding this? Tell me where I was, I have no idea. You ready for 13? Ten. So I'm in 10 now? Yeah. Or it's the beginning 13. of 13. Yeah, 13. I'm at 13. Now the people of Beshemesh were reaping their, harvest, their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beshemesh and stood there. A large stone was there, and they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it. In which were the gold, the articles of gold. And they put them on a large stone. And then the men of Beshemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the number of the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and the country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. That should be the end of the chapter, shouldn't it? They get the, car, the, the Ark of the Covenant back. They immediately take the cart apart. They make a fire. They, they, they give the cows and the articles and the tumors, which, you know. And they burn them up, and they go, oh, praise God. The Ark of the Covenant is back. The Ark of the Covenant is back. And it should end there, right? Big rejoicing. They put it on a big stone. Now it's, the Ark of the Covenant is back. But it doesn't end there. Then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked in the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people, and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Please give me your attention. Let me give you an explanation. Here's where we close. You made it through all the chapters. It, they put the ark there and they look in it. Just because they are Israelites, they have the Word of God, they're supposed to know better. They've got the scrolls, they've got the Old Testament. That is not how the ark was supposed to be placed, and you're never supposed to look in it. The only people that ever went inside the ark were the high priests, and they had for seven days to purify themselves and sacrifice, and they, when they went into the Holy of Holy where the ark was, they, they say they tied a, a, a rope and a bell on their feet so that if they die going to the presence, they'd pull them out. And they know if the bell stopped ringing, the guy was dead. 
You don't mess with, I got to look in it. Don't do it, man. I got to look in it. Don't do it. Anybody remember the, the, the end of the uh, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark when they looked in it? Don't look. Close your eyes. Whole situation. That's where they got it from, guys. Now, I also want to tell you this. Very, very important. One of the reasons you hear me say, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, King of Kings, is although God to me is my friend and he loves me, I never forget the holiness of God. I don't get chummy with God. Rarely will you hear me call him Jesus. Matter of fact, just to leave that name leaves my mouth. In all of scripture, 98% of the time after his resurrection, he was referred to as the Lord Jesus. He's not, hey, my buddy, the, the whole Jesus movement. It, it, it hurts me to say, don't ever forget the, whole, the Israelites, these guys in Beth Shemesh, they forgot the holiness of God. Oh, God loves us. He afflicted the Philistines with tumors. Look, here they are. Oh, disgust, you know, rats, hey. Eh? Let's look in it. I don't think we should do that. Look, God loves us. He's my buddy. I'm just chilling with my homeboy. Dude, be careful. Don't ever forget that. That drives us to our knees. That creates that overwhelming desire in us. Lastly, I want you to see something very important here. And I don't want this to shake or break anybody's faith. I just want you to understand this. You see it says here in verse 19 that he struck them with 50,070 men of the people. That is what's commonly known as a scribal error. A scribal error. It wasn't 50,000. It was 70 men and 50 oxen of men. Now, why does it say that? Even in the old, listen to me, very important. The letters and numbers in Hebrew were the same, and each letter represented a number. When the scribes were interpreting, they made it 50,000 following the letter instead of separating it. Now, you could look this up, and it's really important to understand this. You say, wait a second. You're saying the Bible has errors and mistakes in it? There are a few places in Scripture that are called scribal errors. When they transferred it from the Hebrew to what's called the Latin Vulgate, which is when the Bible was translated from Hebrew to Latin, then to Greek in the Old Testament, they made mistakes, none of which have anything to do with doctrine, none of which have anything to do with prophecy, none of which have anything to do that will what they call bastardize, remove it from the text. This is a scribal error, and there are a few of them in Scripture. As we come to them, I'll point them out to you. Don't let it shake your faith. Don't let it be one of those things. Oh, my goodness, I didn't know. The Bible in spirit is perfect every jot and tittle. Nothing shall pass from this book until all the things that are written in it shall be fulfilled. But don't ever think it's a lucky charm. And I do believe that this is there for a reason. Listen, it's not. You talk to some of my, I talk to some of my Catholic friends and they tell me they have a, 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 bi, a book called a Missal. And it's like one of their Bibles and they read the prayers out of it. And then they do, uh, uh, <coughs> what are those things called when you repeat something over and over again? Chant. Huh? Chant. It's almost like a chant. It's called, I'll remember later on. I'll send you a text or something. But it's a, where they read, this, they just read it over and over. Every day they go back and forth and read it, read it, read it, read it. Our Father who art in heaven, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with. And they don't ever think that that's what it is. The Lord Jesus himself spoke of that. As a matter of fact, I know I'm going wrong. Turn to Mark ch chapter 7. Quickly. Mark 7. Mark 7. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Mark, Matthew, Mark. Second book, New Testament. Yeah. 
Mark chapter 7. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eating bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash hands in a special way, holding the traditions of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not even eat unless they wash, and there are many other things which they have received and hold like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Don't know how you wash a couch. But then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, saying, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, listen, I'm not going to go to the rest of it. Finish there. Close your Bible. In case nobody told you, this is a relationship, not a religion. God is not our luck. He's our providential Father in heaven who leads and guides every step we take. All this done so we could have a relationship with him. Don't honor God with your lips. You could have eight fish and three doves on the back of your car. It doesn't help you. The Lord Jesus said, why do you say you love me and then don't do what my word says? We're not talking about stumbling in the weakness of your flesh. We're talking about a lifestyle that says, I know God says this, I know the Bible says this, but I'm going to do this anyway. You with me? God's not our lucky charm. The Israelites found out the hard way. And look at this. We looked at something 1,800 years later. They're still doing the same thing. Now come now 2,000 years later. The Jews are still doing the same thing. They're still doing it. Like they have these things now called reformed Jews. They keep traditions. They keep feasts. They keep out. Do you believe in God? I'm Jewish. What does that mean? <laughs> Come to church. I can't go to church. Why? Because I'm Jewish. What? So is Jesus. What does that mean? Oh, so you must go to shul or temple. Nope. Why did you just tell me you were Jewish? It's the Sabbath. You keep the Sabbath? No. Do you, you follow me? Especially you that come from a... Be careful. Let's not ever, 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 ever do that to God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. The insanity of your word sometimes makes us laugh. And, and the craziness of the people who did not know you. And the things that they do to try and please you. To get your heavy hand against them. Off of them. God... Thank you for your word, which is a lesson for our lives. Your people, even the chosen ones, our, our brothers and sisters, the Jews, God, we pray that they'd come to know you, every single one of them. God, we pray for the whole world to come, even the Philistines, that they would come to know you in a true and living way. God, thank you for your word. Bless us as we depart from here. May the lessons of your word lead us closer to you. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Praise God.